Next on Viewpoint, is Hollywood and the media out to make Christianity look bad? I think I'd rather support their efforts and try to move them in a positive direction than constantly be criticizing them. Christian filmmaker and author Phil Cook shares his view. And later... Uh, people confuse it by observing people who supposedly are spirit-filled when all the time they aren't. Why does the Holy Spirit seem to be the most misunderstood part of the Godhead? This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Are Christian values being intentionally left out of motion pictures and television? And if so, how do we get it back in? Phil Cook's a filmmaker, media consultant, and author of this book, The Way Back, How Christians Blew Our Credibility and How We Get It Back. He joins us today from Burbank, California. And Phil, you've been out in Hollywood or Burbank for a, a, a couple years, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a long time. And is, has Hollywood changed in its, in its view of what Christianity is and its view of, I guess, the church in general over that time? There's no, there's no question. I think I've been here since 91, and actually I was coming here for a number of years before that. Um, I think that uh, Hollywood has changed. In many ways, the whole culture's changed today. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and one of the things I, I would be clear about is I don't think Hollywood is really anti-Christian. I think many of us have this, you know, yeah. think this myth that Hollywood is virulently anti-Christian, and it's really not. It's just made up of people who are in a business. I, I don't think Hollywood is more anti-Christian than, than uh, plumbers or attorneys or other groups. They're just people that didn't grow up in the church for the most part, that are quite secular, as we see in many other areas of our culture, and they really don't understand what Christianity is all about. Yeah. So what we need are more Christians, I think, who feel called to come out here, look at, stop looking at Hollywood as the enemy, and start looking at Hollywood as a mission field. And we need media missionaries, if you will, who would be willing to come to Hollywood, work from the inside, to start changing the industry. I think that would be the most effective thing we could possibly do. Would the quality still be there? Yeah, I think quality matters. Quality, mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing we've learned over the years. You know, Christians have started making movies that are going to the box office, that are going to theaters. And in the early days, I was encouraging filmmakers to make better quality films mm -hmm. because no matter how great the story, if the movie's shot terribly, nobody wants to watch. Mm -hmm. So quality does matter. But I think at the same time, we have to start engaging the industry because you know what? You may hate Hollywood, but they sure know how to produce and market movies right. and television programs. And so it's not that we want to view them as the enemy so much, but we want to get in there and leverage what their ability that you know they're able to do and get our message inside some of those films. And there are many people right now that are doing a great job of it. Well, it's, it, it is an industry and they're there to make money. And if Christian films or, or films that really lifted up the Christian lifestyle were making money yeah. at the box office, Hollywood's not going to turn that down, are they? That's exactly right. You know, it's interesting that at the turn of the last century, in the beginning of the 1900s, the church made more movies than Hollywood did. The church was mm -hmm. actively, in the early days of the movies, the church was actively involved in movie making. But then the church started to slowly pull back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. And of course, if there's a void, something else is going to fill it. And so we found ourselves in the 70s and 80s with an industry that was almost entirely secular. Then when Mel Gibson created the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and it did so spectacularly well internationally, we realized that uh, Hollywood saw that, wow, there are people that take their faith seriously and really want to see films that take their faith seriously. So Hollywood's been on a slow journey trying to understand who this audience is, how to reach them with products. Sometimes they fail, sometimes they succeed, but I think it's moving in a good direction. Well, there used to be, you, you mentioned the church making movies and, and Christians yeah. making movies. There used to be a board of, of basically they were going to look at movies and decide whether or not they were even viewable or not. Now, yeah. that, that whole board has disappeared now. Yeah, and it was called the Hayes Code. It started. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, a moral code of what you mm -hmm. could do. You couldn't smoke in movies. You couldn't do all kind of things. You couldn't have, and that you had to have twin beds and things like that. <laughs> there you go. I love Lucy. Lucy had twin and Desi beds. Arnaz, you know, yeah. in the Lucille Ball show. They right. had separate beds when they were married. And so we see that, uh, that that's gone away. And mm -hmm. uh, now it's much, you know, more, a lot more freedom out there for filmmakers. It also means you can go in some, you know, dark directions as well. Right. So I think we're seeing Christians that are, that are producers, that are studio executives, that are writers, that are stepping up and at a very high level in the industry in Hollywood. So the, the bottom line is I would tell people watching the program right now is 
Stop criticizing Hollywood and start praying for Hollywood. Think of it as a mission field for real and really start praying for the industry and uh, hopefully move them in a direction to uh, where they would become Christians because that, that, that would the influence of Hollywood, I mean, Hollywood still has the greatest influence in the world sure. of anything out there. So if we could shift that, it would be remarkable. Yeah, we talk about Hollywood as just push the borders, I mean, push the boundaries of what's, what's allowable on television and in movies. I mean, you couldn't use certain words after eight o'clock, before eight o'clock, things like that. Right. Do we want to bring the, the, the boundaries back in or do we just want to bring Christian culture into, the, into Hollywood and hope there's more of that? I don't necessarily want to bring the boundaries back. I mean, obviously there were many good things about it, but it's, at the same time, they restricted some very talented people mm -hmm. and you never know who's going to be in control of the rules. It's like free speech. I would rather, you know, you, the only way to solve bad speech is to create more good speech. It's not to restrict people because whoever's in charge starts restricting things. So the list I don't think is necessary or the Hayes Code type approach. I think it's better to raise up a generation of young filmmakers who are Christians who feel mm -hmm. a real call in their life to go out and change the industry. And, you know, so, so very often we tend to help a young ministry student or a missionary. We tend to offer them a free room in our home or help pay some of their expenses. What about finding a filmmaker in your church or your neighborhood, a young person who feels called to go into the industry mm -hmm. and work? Yeah. Maybe you could help them with their expenses or training or going to film school. That would be a remarkable thing and helping make an impact here in Hollywood. Well, we've, we've seen Hollywood produce films like, like Noah, Yep. things like that, and, and Christians want to boycott it, they want to, don't want to go, it's not biblically correct. Is that what we still need to do with, with films like that? Well, Hollywood's going to make mistakes. Obviously, Noah wasn't uh, the biblical story of Noah. In fact, I was one of the people that negotiated with the studio to create a disclaimer at the front of the movie that just reminded people this was not the biblical story of Noah. Mm -hmm. But I, in spite of all that, I encourage Christians to go to the film, take a non-believing mm -hmm. friend, and after it's over, go to a coffee shop and tell them the real story. Use it as kind of a doorway to help people understand what the real story is. And uh, so I, I just think that even with movies that miss the mark, there's often still an opportunity for evangelism. And so um, Hollywood's trying. I think I'd rather support their efforts and try to move them in a positive direction than constantly be criticizing them because if we continue that approach, they're just gonna pull back and they're not gonna do it at all. So I think you know, praying for the industry, praying for Hollywood is a, is a powerful, powerful thing because as we all know, prayer really does change things. What, what kind of reaction did you get when you negotiated that, that disclaimer at the front of the front of the movie? The studio realized, I mean, we have, I've been here in Hollywood for a long time and I, uh, we, we have enough credibility with the industry that we often get called into situations where they want advice about how to reach the Christian mm -hmm. audience. And so that was a situation where they wanted to see, we actually did a screening of the movie at the National Religious Broadcasters Conference and we got input from them. And so we were able to sit down with the studio leaders and say, look, this is, we don't want to offend, we know whatever you do, you don't want to offend Christians because they're a huge box office, segment of the box office. So they were very willing to put a disclaimer on the front of the movie just to let people know it's not the biblical story. It's more like a science fiction story. And um, it worked really well. And um, I, you know, I still got criticized, I got criticized more from Christians sure. for even being involved yeah. with it than I did from people in the studio. So it's, you know, Christians are still working all that out, right. figuring out how do we deal with this kind of stuff. And, and I'm just thrilled that God's put us in a position here in Hollywood to help people navigate that industry. Well, the whole area of media production, I mean, it's wider now than it's ever been, digital and, yeah. and all types of stre uh, streaming, things like that. Uh, what kind of hope you have for the future as far as Christians coming into the, the production of media? We have a generation of kids today that are making movies on their iPhones. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I think people younger and younger are being fluent with visual media. And so whether it's web, social media, TV, films, I just yeah. I, I feel really good about the future. I, th there's a lot of issues to be concerned about. You know, there's a dark side to social media. There's a dark side to a lot of different media mm -hmm. platforms. But I, I would love to see Christians become more literate in media, understand the power of television and film and social media. And uh, that I think that's the greatest way to combat it. Help teach your children, train them how to use media effectively, how to be responsible with an iPhone, with social media, those things. I believe ultimately that's the answer that we need in order to move forward. All right, it's, it's not going away. We need to know how to use it in, in ways that are going to be positive. Exactly right. It is not going away. And fortunately, we have people like the YouVersion Bible app who are making the Bible available in multiple translations and hundreds and thousands of languages. 
just a, just a tap on an iPhone. So there are people out there innovating, doing some remar remarkable things, and I'm thrilled about the future. The Holy Spirit is as much God is as God is, and is as much Christ as Christ is. Bishop Ronald Hill from Compton, California, will join Bob when Viewpoint returns. The Trinity is a familiar part of our concept of God, yet the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet one-third of that Trinity seems to bring controversy and confusion to many people trying to get a handle on their faith. Joining me is Bishop Ronald Hill. He's pastor of Love Unity Church in Compton, California. And he speaks often on how we can better understand who the Holy Spirit is. And Pastor Hill, glad to have you with us again today. I'm glad to be with you today. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, it is th one-third of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is, is a person. He's part of the Godhead. Explain to us how we can better understand who the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Well, I think it's a very simple concept. The Holy Spirit, of course, as you stated, is the third person in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is as much God is as God is, and is as much Christ as Christ is. He is a part of the very essence of God, the Holy Spirit. And he plays a major role uh, in Christianity. He plays a major role in the creation of the universe. He plays a major role in all aspects of God. He's very important, and it's no wonder that Satan would love to confuse people about who he is because to fail to um, allow him to lead us and guide us is to, is to be hindered as a Christian. Uh, you, you mentioned that the Holy Spirit is, our, is, is like a GPS in our life. Can kind of explain that to us? Well, the Holy Spirit leads us. He, the Holy Spirit is God. He knows the beginning from the ending. He has all power. I'm reminded of what Jesus said about him. Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you helpless. I'm going to send you some help. And he's going to be exactly like me. So he's, he's the most intelligent uh, being in the universe. Uh, I say to people oftentimes, God the Father so loved the world, he sent Jesus the Son. Jesus the Son came and did his job and went back to heaven and sent the Holy Ghost to take his place. So at this moment in history, the Holy Ghost is representing the kingdom of God in the earth realm. He lives inside of us. He leads us and he guides us. And again, he knows everything. He's all powerful and he provides life and fulfillment and direction and supernatural power for the believer. What, what's the... What's the essence of being led by the Holy Spirit? How can we tell that we are or are not being led by the Spirit? I think it's important uh, that we understand, first of all, uh, where I pastor, I promote Bible reading, Bible study, and Bible memorization continuously because the Holy Spirit will always move in tandem with the Word of God. And that's very important to know that because if you're not well-versed in Scripture, a voice can come to you and mimic the Holy Spirit. And if you're not well versed in Scripture, it can lead you out to do something that you swear God told you to do it. Like, hence, we've had people in America over the years who say, well, God told me to kill you. God told me to do this. And they heard a voice, but it was not the voice of God. So to be able to distinguish the, the voice of God over another voice is, is to always know that the Holy Spirit will never say anything that controver that, that's controversial, or, or shall I say, anything that is against uh, the Word of God, number one. And the Holy Spirit will never lead you to do anything that, is, that will harm other people. So you can know that it's the Holy Spirit because He will speak to you in terms of leading you to do the known will and sometimes the spiritual will that God has placed in your life. Now, if people hear uh, kind of church terms like being filled with the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit, it has a tendency to, if someone is a, a non-believer and they're, they're seeking God, that kind of a spiritual thing kind of, kind of confuses them at times and maybe even scares them. Uh, is there a reason to, to be afraid of the Holy Spirit? I think sometimes, and, and I, 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 I don't want to offend anybody by saying this, but I think that there's a lot of ignorance uh, in churches where people are uh, open to the Holy Spirit. Uh, they uh, equate emotionalism 
displaying a lot of noise and maybe dancing and expressing themselves demonstrously before uh, uh, before God. Uh, uh, and, and people assume that that means that you are being led by the spirit or that you spirit feel. Spirit feel can be a, a very quiet experience and being spirit filled and spirit led basically is the same thing because one cannot be led by the spirit if they aren't filled with the spirit. And if you feel with the spirit, you have the potential of being led by the spirit. So I think that um, uh, people confuse it by observing people who supposedly are spirit filled when all the time they aren't. And so God will never do anything to embarrass you. He will never do anything to, to cause you to display any ignorance. He's a gentleman. He's intelligent. And he always leads us to give glory and honor to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is in the earth to glorify Jesus. And so we, the, the, there's no basic difference between being the Holy Spirit filled or being led by the Spirit. It's just the fact that we hear the voice of God and we obey him. That's being led by the Spirit. Now, there's people out there right now that aren't really familiar with the, with the, the Bible or the Word of God. And they're always, uh, people say, well, I'm, I'm afraid that I've committed the unpardonable sin. And there's a place in the Bible that talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is an eternal sin and is not forgivable. Can, can you address that? Can you, can you explain that to us? Well, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, well, I guarantee you, if you're concerned about it, you haven't done it. That's what I always say. Because... <laughs> So if you're concerned about it, you haven't done it. And, 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 and uh, when people are overly concerned about it, it means that Satan is just playing a game on your mind. Because if you are so corrupt and so demonically controlled that you would blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you don't care and, and, and you're not concerned at all because you would not have the, the enough uh, reality about God in your soul to care. So if I was somebody out there being concerned about that, I wouldn't worry about it at all. If you're concerned about it, you haven't done yeah, it. Yeah, is there is there a way that uh, somebody says, "Well, I th this this spiritual thing really puts me off. I'm afraid of it." Is there a way that they can follow God, understand the Word of God, understand God's will in their life, and not be led by the Holy Spirit? It seems like that's the Holy Spirit's job description. Yeah, I think it's impossible. It it is impossible for a person to walk with God without walking in the Spirit, because the Bible says God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you can't know God except you know God by the Holy Spirit. You can't come to God except you come by way of the Holy Spirit. And of course, you can't walk with God without walking in the Holy Spirit. Can you give, a, give us an example of how you've seen the Holy Spirit work in your own life? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just one really good example. You know, I, you know this, sure this may, sound a, little, daily it may sound a little hard to you. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, I just left a prayer meeting. And I shared this in the prayer meeting today. There was a girl that I was going to marry back in the day. Now, I've been married 46 years, so it's been many years Congratulations. ago. Congratulations. Her, her, her name was Bertha, and she was a chocolate, beautiful black girl. And I was enamored with her. And I had decided to marry her. And unknowingly, God didn't want me to marry her. She had done something that I was uh, displeased with. And she promised me that she'd never do it again, that she would, she would not uh, ever think of doing it again. And, I, and, and you know, love is blind, and I, and I believed her. She had had a minor surgery, and um, she was living with her sister at the time. I, 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 so I went out and play, played basketball this particular night, and I never do this. I came to my apartment, sit on the edge of the bed, fell back, and went fast asleep. After being asleep for 35, 40 minutes, now get this now, don't let this spook you out. But a hand came into my chest and bounced me up and down on the bed and, and I awakened and the, uh, the voice of God said, call Bertha. His name was Bertha. Call Bertha. I get on the phone. Long story short, the Holy Spirit tells me to drive over to her, her, her home where she was living at the time. And I got over there and there she was sitting out in front of the house in the car with a married man. And the love that I thought I had for her just all drained out. That was the Holy Spirit. I never would have gotten the wife that I, that I have now had the Holy Spirit not warned me. The Holy Spirit will lead you. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Well, you mentioned something there that a lot of non-believers, a lot of non-Christians wouldn't understand when you said you were, you were praying in the Spirit, you were praying in tongues. Quickly explain that to me. 
Well, I understand that, and, 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 I, and I was hesitant to even mention that, to be frank with you, because I know speaking in tongues is, um, is, is a controversy, and some people believe in it, some don't. I was raised in a Baptist church in East Texas where nobody ever mentioned the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when people got happy in that church, they would fan them and drag them out. So I, I had no experience with uh, with, with tongues in the, in, the, in the Baptist church because as a child, I used to wonder why are they dragging Mrs. Johnson out of the church? I couldn't figure that out. Well, or Mrs. Johnson. Uh, yes. <laughs> so fast forward. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, was, I was seeking God. The Lord had dealt with me. He had dealt with me. I was not even going to a church. I was just spending my time reading the Word of God and praying. I was so ignorant of the Word of God until um, uh, I would get in my closet, take all the clothes out, and get in my closet and pray because the Bible said when you pray, get into your closet. So I figured I was going to try God for six months. I told God, I said, I'm going to try you for six months. That's obedience. Prior to that time, I hated God. My sister got ill and she died. Six months later, my mother died. Nine months later, my grandmother died. I used all the profanity I could muster, and I cursed God out and told him I wouldn't have anything else to do with him because I was so hurt and bruised inside. Went all the way to Vietnam now. Of course, in Vietnam, I prayed. <laughs> but... Um, but I was away from God. And he started talking to me and dealing with me. And uh, so I, I wasn't in anybody's church. I asked a question on the bus. I was driving the bus. And this big, uh, huge black lady get on the bus. And I asked her about the closet experience. And she said, what closet experience? As well, the Bible said, when you pray, get into your closet. Everybody on the bus began to laugh. And I'm thinking, what's so funny? I'm, I'm in this closet. I'm sweating. I'm about to pass out. And they're laughing. And so the lady said to me, she said, where do you go to church? I said, I don't go to church. She said, you need to go to church. So she invited me, unknowing to me, to a Pentecostal church, a church of God in Christ. And when I went into that church, a man by the name of Bishop S.M. Crouch laid hands on me. And a few days after then, I was in my apartment praying alone and tongues took me over. I didn't ask for them. They took me over so I know that they're legitimate. So praying in tongues is the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and it's a gift that you can use to build yourself up uh, in the spiritual arena. Well, Bishop, I'm sure that gives a lot of people a lot of hope today. Thank you for being with us today. Today, you may have heard some viewpoints different than you've ever heard from your friends, family, or even the church. Well, the point of our program is to have our guests explain their opinions based on their experiences and their faith. One thing we want to be clear about is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible says that people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, we hope this program gives you a bit more insight into what the Bible says and that it's relevant for your life today. If you want to know more or watch other interviews on demand, go to our webpage or our Facebook page. Here's what's on the next viewpoint. How should churches respond to same-sex couples attending services? And so for me also, uh, Paul told the church in Corinth that uh, there were some in their midst who used to be homosexual. So, so God transforms people's lives. I mean, that's the good news of the gospel. And so if I get in trouble for that, I can live with that. Author Pastor Daniel Fusco will join Bob. What nobody realizes is that when the church asks a same-sex couple to separate, you're actually asking them to be lonely for the rest of their life if you don't intend to invite them into your home and let them be a part of your family. It's like, this pastor changed my life by giving me access to a family I'm Bob Placey. Join me on the next Viewpoint.